Good afternoon. Let's, let's apply what Dion taught us, all right? Good afternoon. <laughs> oh, very good. <laughs> you guys are great. All right. Um, I will do a lot of this, like Dion, so you keep, go- you keep awake and keep, keep up. I felt like going after Dion is like subbing in for LeBron. I'm like, <laughs> really? <laughs> How's that going to happen? Uh, thanks for being here. Been a great, great day so far. And Lord willing, it will continue to uh, encourage you. I'm going to raise your mic up a little bit. All right. To you. Perfect. I think. <laughs> if I bang my head on it, <laughs> I'll know it's too close, right? Hopefully. All right. So um, this afternoon, if, if you're here for team-based ministry, um, you're in the right room. If you're here for anything else, you're in the wrong room. Uh, youth is over that way. Women is towards the front. And to keep the passion, that's Dion. Uh, he's next door. Uh, let's pray. And then we'll get into our our study and talk together. God, we just want to thank you for uh, a a wonderful, very filling day that you've blessed us with so far. And we're kind of only partway through. Um, We thank you, God, that you've brought each one of us here today. Uh, Not only getting us here safely in our travels, uh, but you've, you've set us aside and you've set this day aside for us so that you can meet with us and that we get to meet with you. And Lord, we just thank you that you love us, that we're your, your dearly loved children and that we get to spend time with you like this. Thanks for blessing us this way. We ask that as we open your word and... Um, talk about ministry. Lord, may, may we learn from you, um, and even in sharing our own experiences, may it, we're not the fount of all knowledge, Lord. You are. So we're here to glean from you. We pray you'd put things in our heart and our mind that need to be there. We pray you'd remove things that don't need to be there. And just have your way with us. We thank you for the churches that you allow us to serve, uh, the people that we get to serve. And we want to do that well, Lord. We want to be um, instruments that you use for your glory. We ask that this time will be used to develop that and grow that in us. We ask for your blessing on the other meetings as people gather throughout this building today. Uh, Lord, thank you that you're not bound to one place but your spirit is here working amongst all of us. We praise you together. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, so my name is Daniel Gedemi. I have the privilege of pastoring in Las Vegas, New Mexico. Uh, I have uh, been serving the Lord for about 30 years now, and the last four and a half or so have been in Las Vegas Uh, in northern New Mexico. Prior to that, I spent over 20 years in the Pacific Northwest in ministry there and have served in in a couple different places in New Mexico in the in-between times. Um, I want to just say from the outset that whenever I talk about how how to do ministry, um, I, I feel, as Dion had talked about, fairly inadequate about that. Um, all I can teach, share with you is things that I've learned and experiences that I've had. So I do like to have interaction so that we can learn from each other as well. So as we go through this, there will be parts where I go, I'm going to pause. And if you have questions or anything you'd like to add, uh, then let's do that. It can be a little interactive that way. Uh, if, if we're in the middle of something and you're thinking of something, write it down. And then when we do our pause part, 
bring it out and share and uh, we can learn from each other that way. Sound good? Okay, so the uh, first thing I'd like to do is kind of go through a biblical and theological grounding for team-based ministry. Um, now, you might think, well, what other type of ministry is there? Um, well, there's the solo approach at ministry. Um, a lot of us have experienced that. Uh, there's the, uh, you get started and people f f kind of dissipate type of ministry and a lot of us have experienced that. Um, but I think that there's a particular way that the Bible shows us how God desires to um, see ministry done and the Bible doesn't necessarily name it as team-based. I don't think that that was really a Hebrew concept or a, a Greek concept. That's more of an American concept. Uh, but I think we'll see what it means as we look in the scriptures or we'll identify it in the scriptures themselves. We begin in, in Ephesians chapter 4. And, and by the way, I'll, I'll just kind of work through the outline that I gave you. And I think I gave you, if you'd like to take notes, there's little lines to take notes on there. In Ephesians chapter Chapter 4, uh, the Apostle Paul reminds the church in Ephesus, he gave some, this is talking about uh, the Lord, he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So it's a beautiful picture there. It is not a picture of one person or a small group of people in a congregation who do all the work of ministry. It is a picture or, or a, um, an explanation of particular gifts, office gifts, you might call them, office of apostle, prophets, evangelists, shepherd, teachers, particular gifts that God gives to the church that through the use of those gifts, the exercising of those gifts, uh, the congregation itself, the body of Christ will be built up so that the people, the, the believers will do ministry. So it's, it's like, it's, we're all in on that. It's not just a few people who do the ministry in the church. It's all of us are called to be servants and do ministry. And not just in the church, but outside to the world as well. So where does this come from? Where does this, uh, how do we know that this is really the heart of God? Well, first of all, it's there in the scriptures. But the model is actually given in the triune God himself. Now, I'm going to ask you to kind of think deeply here for a moment, uh, because anytime we talk about God as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the triune God, um, we kind of struggle with that because we, that's, that's a hard one for us to grasp. And yet, when God reveals himself to us and makes himself known to us in the scripture, he reveals himself as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, as the triune God. This quote is a little bit helpful. This is uh, from Scott Horrell, I think is his name, out of a book on the Trinity. And he says, the one divine being eternally exists as three distinct centers of consciousness, wholly equal in nature, genuinely personal in relationships, and each mutually indwelling the other. Okay, read that again. <laughs> The one divine being eternally exists as three distinct centers of consciousness, wholly equal in nature, genuinely personal in relationships, and each mutually indwelling the other. In other words, God exists in the interconnected, eternally loving, triune fellowship of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. God is the, the, the ultimate, he, he is, he, he is the ultimate loving being. And there's this eternal loving relationship of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And out of God's communal life as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit flows his perfectly harmonious ministry to us. 
And when I say perfectly harmonious, it means that it's not like the Holy Spirit does something that God the Father is somehow out of step with. Or Jesus acts in a way that, that, um, that the Spirit is like, well, that's, where is that coming from? Now, there's a perfect harmony in their relationship together, which is also expressed in their work or ministry or life towards us. And so that, uh, that perfectly harmonious ministry is for our good and it also accomplishes God's glory. So uh, in, in creating us, in uh, sustaining us, in redeeming us, in, in uh, using us, in all of that, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit are in perfect harmony to do all of that for our good and for God's glory. So in all that God does, he does in union as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Why does that matter? It helps us understand that if, if we are image bearers of God, and if we are the body of Christ, then that's the type of relationship that's meant to exist amongst us as his people. Jesus talked about this uh, several times, especially in the Gospel of John. It's recorded for us in John chapter 5, verse 19. So Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of his own accord, but only what he sees the Father doing, for whatever the Father does, uh, th that the Son does likewise. So Jesus and the Father are in, in, in full unity together in all that he does. In John chapter 10, Jesus said in verse 30, I and the Father are one. And if, if you think, well, you know, he's not really talking about a, a unity or a oneness in totality. No, he is, be, and, and the people understood that because the very next verse tells us they started to pick up rocks so that they could kill him. In John chapter 17, as Jesus is praying that high priestly prayer in John 17, he prays, I am no longer in the world, uh, but they are in the world, and I am coming to you, Holy Father, keep them in your name, which you have given me, that they may be one, even as we are one. That's amazing. That union that, that Christ has with the Father, uh, Jesus says that through him in Christ, we are brought into that loving and eternal fellowship with the triune God. Now we get to experience that to the degree that we're able to, to understand it and, and uh, enjoy it, but there's a day coming when we're gonna get to see him face to face and that's gonna be so glorious. Jesus went on, he continued to pray there in John chapter 17, verses 20 and 21. Uh, he, he prayed, I don't ask for these only, talking about his, his disciples there, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. So that's you and I. We've received the word of the apostles, the gospel, and we've believed on that. And so Jesus was praying for us. He says, also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. Everybody not only gets to all, all of us that that have come into uh, new life through faith in Jesus Christ, been born again by the Spirit of God, we get to come into this uh, union with the Lord, not just as individuals, but as people, as a people, God's people. John chapter 16, the last one here, when the Spirit of truth comes, he'll guide you into all the truth, for he will not speak on his own authority. But whatever he hears, he will speak and he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me. This is Jesus speaking. For he will take what is mine and declare it to you. 
All that the Father has is mine. Therefore, I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. There's this beautiful example of the activity of the triune God in ministry to the world. God the Father uh, through the Son working in in conjunction with the Holy Spirit uh, and then to and through us as his people in this world. We could probably kind of sit there for a while and just let that spin in our our minds and go, whoa, that's amazing, Lord. We're so blessed. He's so good. But I want you to understand this is the origin of a team-based ministry approach because we've been invited into, uh, let's call it the first string, the, the ultimate team between of, of the triune Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We're invited into his life and his ministry to the world. We get to be a part of God's team. That's pretty amazing. Now, let me stop there, pause, and say, any questions? I probably don't have an answer, but I'll do my best. Or any comments about that? Anything? All right. Good, good. Let's continue then. We will get into practical stuff, I promise. But I want us to have a strong biblical theological foundation for why we understand ourselves as being called to team ministry. The New Testament. Uh, In the New Testament, there are some examples of team-based ministry we see in the New Testament. The church is, is birthed and called to this, but even before the church is birthed and called to this, we have Jesus. God sends his son into the world. In Luke chapter 6, Early in Jesus' ministry, uh, we find him praying. In Luke chapter 6, verses 12 through 16, we find Jesus praying. He goes up and he prays. And what he's praying about is uh, who he's going to be choosing as his disciples. He chooses 12 disciples out of the many people that were following him at that time. So why does Jesus choose disciples? I mean, he's, he's God, right? So why does he need disciples Well, his ministry was growing. The next passage in Luke 6 there tells us that there were multitudes of people that were gathering around him. So these disciples are useful in service to him and for the ministry and the mission that he had been sent to accomplish. So even Jesus didn't go it alone. Now he could have called angels, right? He could have said, I I need kind of need like a legion of angels. That would work really well. But he didn't do that. He called these 12 disciples. And I imagine if we could have seen the resume list of the many disciples he could have chosen from, I'm guessing that these were probably not the ones we would have put at the top. They're the ones you'd be like, really? I thought we weeded him out early. No, no, that's who I'm calling Also by being with him all the time, he was able to teach and train them to prepare them for the future ministry that they would be called to after his death and resurrection and ascension. So Jesus calls them to himself, calls them to serve uh, serve him and serve with him. And in doing that, he's then going to give them this particular ministry as apostles where they're going to go and take, uh, take that ministry to the next level to the to the whole world really once the spirit has has uh, come and empowered them to do so so Jesus knows that's going to happen he knows that that's not what he's going to do but he's going to do it through them so he calls them to serve with him Luke chapter 10 we go on in the book of Luke and we see that Jesus not only chose those 12 apostles, but then he sends out 72 other disciples to preach and minister in his name. So again, he gathers a, a group of people. There's, there's a bunch of them that are following him and he identifies 72 of them. That's a pretty big team. And he sends them out. I want you to notice in that passage, he does not send them out one by one. What does he send them out as? Two by two, Right? That's team ministry. Now, we could 
guess that there's probably a thousand reasons why it's wise to send people out two by two and not one by one. Jesus sent them out two by two. And later in the chapter, they returned. They were amazed at what the Lord had done through them. And so throughout the Gospels, Jesus develops teams and he uh, uses them and sends them and equips them. Whoever he calls and is going to send, he also equips them to do the work. I think if Jesus operates in teams, it's, it's a good idea for us to consider that as well. What if we continue on past the time of, of Jesus after he has uh, been crucified and buried and resurrected and he has ascended to heaven? We see the example of team-based ministry also early in the, in the very early church. The example of the earliest church, the first church in Jerusalem in Acts chapter 6. Acts chapter 6, um, anybody remember what's going on there? Oh, come on, those of you that were in the first class. There you go, there you go. Yes, there was that crisis of, hey, our widows aren't getting fed the way that they should be fed. And the apostles who had their ministry were like, well, we can't. We can't leave our ministry to do this ministry. It's an important ministry. So we need to raise up others to do this ministry. We need a team of deacons is ultimately what we would identify them as servants. And there's a need to identify and ordain uh, people to specific vocations in the church. The church had exploded. It was growing. And as the church grows, the ministry needs grow. And it's too much for one person. It's too much even for a, a, a group of people. It needs to be handed out and spread out to those who are gifted and called to that. And so the church itself was asked to recognize who those people were and they put certain people before the apostles and the apostles could uh, say, yeah, th these guys have, have uh, God's hand upon their life. We recognize that calling and they did the ministry. They did it in teams of people. If you go on farther in the book of Acts, Acts chapter 15. In Acts 15, you have this interesting situation where there's a disagreement that has arisen in the church. Not just the church in Jerusalem, but the church as it's begun to spread to Gentile territories. And so the gospel is being taken to Jews amongst the Gentiles outside of Israel. Uh, but Gentiles are starting to come to faith in Jesus and there's a group of people that are like, no, that can't happen. They actually need to convert to Judaism first and then start keeping the law and then they could truly become followers of the Messiah. And there was a problem with that in the church and so they said, well, we need to talk about this. We need to address this. The first council of the church, the Jerusalem council, we see that even amongst the various ministry teams there, that they gathered together and they acknowledged, even in their teams, there were certain leaders amongst them. There were no church buildings yet. The church in Jerusalem was huge. And now you've got Paul and uh, I believe he brought Timothy with him, or not Timothy, um, 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 Barnabas, thank you. Barnabas with him. And they meet there. There's no church building. The church is happening in, in homes and, and throughout the, the city, which means that within those homes and in those, those gatherings throughout the city, there's various elders. So there's a whole bunch of levels of leadership and, and servants, and those leaders come together. And even amongst the leaders, we see that there are leaders amongst the leaders. James, Peter, everybody in the meeting had a voice. But there were some who were recognized as being called by God to be sort of a, a final voice for all of them that they could agree with. Now that's important, keep that in mind when we talk about developing team leadership approach. Because even amongst a group of leaders, there's leaders. If we go on and we see the example of Paul's ministry, 
Acts chapter 13. Paul uh, had been sent, or God had had him in Tarsus for a season of his life, and then uh, Barnabas went to Tarsus, brought him over to Antioch, and in Antioch, there was a great group of leaders in that church. Paul and Barnabas were a part of that. And through that leadership, as they met with the Lord, as they worshiped the Lord together, the Lord spoke to them and said, hey, set these two apart for me. He's going to send them out. Notice that when God called and was sending someone into a particular ministry, it was not just one. There was two. At least two. As a matter of fact, they added John Mark. They added a third. So uh, as, as Paul begins his ministry, his evangelistic ministry, his first mission ministry, you might say, he didn't go alone. He went out as a team. As you follow Paul's journey in the book of Acts, he's constantly adding people to the travel team. Uh, people are getting saved and they're getting discipled and, and he'll start bringing them along with him. Sometimes they get uh, sent off and they go back to where they were from. So Timothy and, and, and Silas are like that. Paul serves with them and as he continues on, he'll send them back to other places and then they'll come back. But even when Paul sends them on, the one time we ever see Paul alone is in Athens, even then it's just for a short time, while he's waiting for Timothy and Silas to come back. Sometimes people are sent by their church to go and work with Paul out in the ministry so that when we come to the book of Romans, which is roughly 20 plus years into Paul's uh, uh, mission ministry when he writes Romans, when you come to the book of Romans and you read chapter 16 of Romans, there's this long list of people that Paul names by name. He commends them, he sends greetings to them, and he identifies them as ministry partners because they've served with him in the gospel mission over the course of these years. So his team grew. Even though they're not necessarily with him, he recognized, hey, we're all, on, we're all doing the same thing, aiming for the same thing together, to see the gospel taken and to see people saved and to see people uh, 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 discipled and become uh, disciplers and then to go out and, and see more people. We're all in this together and Paul keeps them as members, you might say, of his ministry team. One more and I'll stop. That is instructions that he gave to the church in Corinth. I love the church in Corinth because I feel like it's every church. <laughs> it's messy. They have really crazy questions. Um, they have this glorious work of God that's happening amongst them. There's gifts of the spirit happening. Love the church of Corinth. But one of the things that Paul had to write to them about and explain to them is this understanding that the local church lives and functions as a body, the body of Christ within that community, community, most, most places. Um, so we, we say, okay, well, there's the big C church that, that God is using these multiple churches and, and somehow he's using all of them together in some way. But we have our local church that we're a part of. And we're a body. And it isn't so much dealing with how to develop team ministry as it is recognizing the importance of every part of the church body working together as a whole. When you read that section, Paul is, is talking about how the body functions, how a physical body functions. And if that's how the body functions and we are the body of Christ here on this earth, then that's how we need to function. The Holy Spirit distributes gifts in a local congregation in such a way that that congregation can function and accomplish the purposes for which it exists. Why has God got you there? Why is this church there? Because God has a purpose for it. And what is your part in, in that purpose? That's your part in the body. So if we understand that about the whole body, then we should also understand that to be true about the various ministries within the church body. Sort of like 
my body, it's, if it's healthy, it's going to function. Um, but there's even systems and things going on in my body that are unique to themselves that make the whole body work well or not. That's true in our churches. Our church, uh, in order to function well and to be healthy, uh, it needs all the, the ministries themselves to function well and be healthy and to grow into uh, healthy, a healthier um, body, I guess you might say. So the work of ministry is meant to be conducted and enjoyed by the entire church community. Various capacities that that happens, things that are seen, things that are unseen, that's how the body works. That's how team ministry works. I want to stop right there and say, okay, let's pause. Are there any questions or anything that you're thinking about? What about this in regards to what the scriptures um, kind of describe for us as team-based ministry? Yes, sir. <laughs> yes. Yes. Yep. Yeah, that's a hard part about ministry is sometimes, <laughs> so, so if I could put it in, in, I guess, a sports analogy is somebody get, sometimes people get traded. Like you come to an impasse, you go, okay, the best way for you to keep going is to find another team to work on or to play with. And we see that with Paul and Barnabas. They both continued on in, in ministry and serving the Lord, um, but it kind of went different directions. Now our tendency is to go, well, obviously God was on Paul's team because <laughs> look, we have, we know what happened. Well, that's not necessarily true. It just means that Luke was following Paul's ministry, so that's why we have it reported to us. And God would continue to use Barnabas as well. If there's correction to be made, God would make that. We see that with Mark. So Paul and, and Mark still maintained uh, fellowship and eventually connect, reconnected again in ministry. It's a great, good point to, to make. Anything else stand out to you? Okay, let's get really practical then because what does this look like for us in our churches today developing a team-based ministry in the church that you're a part of um, it can be challenging it can be difficult it it can be very rewarding um, but there are certain things and again I'm not, a, I'm not a pro on this. I'm just going to share with you some things that, that uh, I've learned along the way and things that maybe you go, hey, I've, I've seen that too or that didn't work for us or whatnot. Number one is pastors, elders, and leaders have to ask what ministries exist and why they exist in a church. So if you're a pastor here, you're an elder, you're part of a leadership team at some level where you ask that question, what ministries exist in our church and why do they exist? The reason why that's the first question we need to ask, and you kind of have to be prepared because you will, it's like, hey, there's a hornet's nest, let's throw a rock at it and see what happens. Uh, you, will, you will stir the pot when you do this. The reason we need to ask that is because it's not our church. The church belongs to the Lord. And so we have to kind of be consistently going before the Lord and saying, Lord, what do you want to do here? What are you doing here? What needs to change here? Some ministries may be being unnecessarily propped up. We started this ministry and it had a, a wonderful uh, a purpose and place for a season but then it kind of just isn't 
that, that purpose in place really isn't there anymore, but we keep it propped up because we started it or because Brother Joe is running it or because Sister Sue loves that and we're holding something up that really it's, we're maintaining it, not the Lord. We also need to ask, why do they exist? If there's a ministry that God is, is calling us to, well, there's a purpose for it. So sometimes we have to look at our ministries and go, what's the point of this? Well, the point is, and sometimes when you look at that and you say, well, the point is a, this, this, and this. And you're at a point where like that, that, and that have already, that, that's happened. So we don't kind of need to keep doing this anymore. Some ministries may be being unnecessarily propped up. Some ministries will need to be intentionally built up. So we might look at some ministries in the church and go, that ministry, it's really important and it's needed and we need to give more attention to it. We're actually giving so much attention to this over here that it really, we need to give more attention to this. And it doesn't need to be that we take from this to give to this. But sometimes we have too many things going and our, we're not attuned to the Lord of what he wants to do. So how will you know? <laughs> well, you have to ask the question. You have to pray. And you have to wait on the Lord to give you clarity. But the reason that we begin there is because we don't want to try to develop teams for a ministry that God isn't calling us to, to do as a body. Number two, be honest and realistic about who you are as a church currently and who you believe God is calling you and shaping you to be going forward. Um, whenever I come to a church like, like this church, I'm like, oh, I got ideas. I got dreams now, Lord. <laughs> but this is not, this is, our church doesn't, isn't this church. This is a wonderful church, awesome ministry. But you can't take this and apply it. We, are, we, are, we don't do that. We don't take something and, okay, let's go do it here and we're going to get that. That's not necessarily how it works. So we have to be honest and realistic about who we are as a church currently and who we believe God is calling us, shaping us to be going forward. Does the church have a stated vision or mission that reflects what the leadership believes God is calling the congregation to? Does the congregation know what that is? So as a pastor and, and with uh, other pastors and elders in our, in our church, we have to take time and say, okay, Lord, what is, what is it that you, what is our church meant to do? <laughs> Who are we meant to be in our community? What's our calling to this, this place or to this world? Why have you brought us together? And then allow the Lord to give you vision for that. And then make that known. Make that known to the church. Does the congregation know it? People often don't serve because they don't know what the goal or purpose is in serving. Let me give you an example of this. Children's ministry. Especially in smaller churches, children's ministry is like the black hole that nobody wants to go into. She's like, please, we need children's, we need volunteers. And you know, you could just see it. People's faces, as soon as they're like, don't look at me. <laughs> That's right. Well, you know what happens? You sign up for children's ministry, nobody ever sees you again. <laughs> That's it. Sorry. <laughs> And it's kind of like this dirge when somebody is, signs up. You're like, oh, God bless you. I'm so sorry. <laughs> we'll never see you again. I had this happen at a church I pastored before, and, and, and it woke me up to this. That we had this wonderful uh, couple that was leading our children's ministry, and they did, a, uh, they did a great job with it. But they were never in church. They were never in worshiping with adults. And uh, the wake-up call was when they came to me and said, we feel like God's telling us to leave the church. I'm like, what are you talking about leave the church? You're running the children's ministry. You don't just leave the church. I'm like, well, we don't know the church. We're not a part of the church. 
we've entered the black hole. <laughs> you know, there's no getting back. And I realized, oh no, that's not on them. That was totally on me and on, on our leadership, our, our elders that that was a problem, so we had to make some adjustments. Uh, today, though, our, our church vision that, that, that we have as a church is to see faith, family, community, faith, family, and con community renewed through the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ for the good of Las Vegas and beyond. That's our simple vision statement. See, faith, family, community renewed through the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ for the good of Las Vegas and beyond. Now, you say, well, faith, family. We live in a community where it's old school um, uh, Catholicism. And so many of them have a dead faith. Their faith needs to be renewed. They need to hear and believe in the gospel of Jesus Christ. So their faith needs to be re renewed. We have massive families. Everybody's related to everybody in Las Vegas. So we want to see the gospel penetrate our families, save one, and start bringing in the others. And the next thing you know, we have, we have families in our church that seat 40 people on a Sunday. Because this sister got saved, and that sister, and that brother, and they bring their kids, and then their aunts, and their uncles. And the next thing you know, the, the family is being renewed. And we want to see the community re renewed because we're, we desperately need it. We need Jesus to rescue us. We need Jesus to renew our, our city. Well, um, I convey that pretty consistently to the church and then I try to make the connection where in children's ministry, part of renewing family is that we capture the hearts of the children. And so if you serve in children's ministry, you're part of God's mission in our church to our city. You're helping capture the next generation. We use that language a lot. We want to catch the next generation. So we ha don't have such a hard time gathering uh, children's ministry volunteers because they see that if I do this, I'm actually a part of what God is doing in the church. Not just a black hole. So does the congregation know what that vision is for the church. Number three, pray about which ministries to emphasize or prioritize. Again, this is kind of on a pastor elder level, um, but even if you're if you're uh, directing a ministry, maybe you're running a children's ministry or a women's ministry or or any type of ministry, you kind of have to pray about which. Which parts of that do you emphasize or prioritize? Because God will raise someone or a group of people who have a heart for a particular ministry up in the church. And sometimes people will come to me as a pastor, they'll come and say, man, pastor, I just got this, I have this desire to do this. And it's usually something great. But it may not be necessarily what what we're doing as a church or where we're going as a church. So I'm not going to create something for them to do that. It, it will, I've done that before. It eventually implodes and people get mad and, and leave. So I have to say, well, here's what we're doing. How, can you be a part of that? Are, are, are you willing to join what we're doing? I had um, a young man come to me a couple years ago. And uh, he was, he came, you know those, those people that sit in the front row, maybe some of you are those people. You sit in the front row, and like most people avoid the front row, but you get a few that will come and sit in the front row, and man, they got their Bible open, and they got a notepad, and they're staring at you, they're like Dion's dream congregant. <laughs> I had this young man, he came, and he was that guy, and so I was like, whoever you are, I want to meet you because uh, you're here for a reason. So I got with him and he just had this passion to do youth ministry. Now here's what's a funny thing. We had been praying. We didn't have a youth ministry. We want a youth ministry. It's part of our mission is to, to, to reach that next generation to see faith, family, and community renewed through the gospel. Well, we kind of need to catch the youth. So Lord, would you send somebody to us? And in time, he sent somebody to us. But this guy was not at all prepared to lead anything. He had passion, but he didn't have maturity yet. And so 
because we had been praying for this and we knew we wanted to emphasize this, then it meant when I, when I recognize it, I go, okay, then I need to pour into this person. So you carefully vet those people. Are they ready to lead? Do they need discipleship? Um, you let the reins out slowly. You keep them accountable. It took, I met with him on a weekly basis for a year before we were ready to be at the point where, okay, now let's, let's consider doing a youth ministry. What would that look like? And then about three months later, we went to the families and the students and we said, we're going to have a meeting and we want to talk to you about starting a youth ministry. And we had that and I was thinking, okay, we're going to talk to them and they're going to, they're going to pray about it and come back to us. They wanted to start next week. And I'm going, oh no, this, I don't know that he's ready next week. <laughs> so let's do it together. So he and I started a youth ministry together and within about a month, he was really ready to to go. I just kept going to youth group and just l watched and listened and worshiped and so forth and then finally just kind of could fade off. I still meet with him every week. We're three years into it. I still meet with him every week. But if I would have thrown him in when he wanted to go, oh, it would have been a disaster. Would have been a disaster. So you have to pray about which ministries to emphasize and prioritize. And then recognize that every ministry needs a plethora of gifts and skills to be employed in order to, for that ministry to function well and potentially to grow. So leaders need to identify their own strengths and weaknesses and then invite properly qualified uh, people to help where they're weak. So this is how teams grow. That, okay, I'm not great at this part. And so Lord, would you please send somebody for us for this part? Now, what we've seen is sometimes in our church, ministries begin, we have good leaders for it, uh, a small team that gets started, and that ministry starts to grow and it starts to be effective, and then there's a need for more, more qualified leaders with specific gifts and, and skills in different areas in order for it to keep growing, and sometimes you just got to wait, because you can't just plug people in and say, it's like on a basketball team, again. If you get somebody who's never dribbled the ball, they're probably not going to be a good point guard. Like, no, don't do that. L don't, don't put them in there. It's, it's not going to work. Okay. I want to stop right there because we've covered a, a lot of ground. And let's, are there any questions thus far about developing team this, to this point in team ministry? There's, there's more to go, but... Anything standing out to you? Pastor Jim, you probably have all kinds of good stories. But you can't tell them because some of the people that are in your church are here. So you got to be careful. <laughs> Only good stories, right? Yes, sir. Yes. And so it's part of that because, like you said, the black hole. So the people aren't being involved in doing that, it's just causing that direction. Yes. Great question. So, what do you do, um, especially in the area of children's ministry, to encourage people's participation in that? Um, number one is you have to communicate what you just communicated. So, it has to be communicated why children's ministry is important. It's not important because it gives the kids something to do while the adults are, you know, studying the Bible. It's important because we're either, either reinforcing what those children are learning at home or we are the first layer of hearing about Jesus that, that they're going to get. 
And we can catch them when they're young. The Lord can catch them when they're young. If we can catch them when they're young, we can help them grow into godly young men and women who love the Lord, who have a passion for him, so that when they're adults, or when they enter that, the, the biggest space, there's, there's a book that's come out recently, um, and I'm just forgetting about the name, but it talks about, uh, uh, oh, it's called The Great Dechurching. It talks about the last 30 years in the, uh, of the church has been this, there's been a huge shift and there's been like three or four huge shifts in church life in, in the United States in its history. The first three were all people going into the church. The church grew by leaps and bounds in these three big segments of time. This last one is the first time where the church, evangelical church in particular, but, but uh, church across the board has seen a decline in numbers. And the biggest area of decline is from 18 to 26. So it's that window when kids graduate high school and go into college and then go into their early career life. That's where we lose them the most. So capture them early and then develop ministry that helps them grow through and deal with everything that they go through and then, by the time they're 18, by God's grace, they're mature enough to understand the importance of staying in fellowship, the importance of continuing to grow. And then you also have to say, okay, how do we help them do that? Yeah, it, where we're from in Las Vegas, we have a university, but we have a lot of people that leave Las Vegas and never want to come back. So it's like, okay, but if you leave, where are you going to go and what are you going to do? And how are you going to stay plugged in? We want to help them make that transition. But if we don't catch them back here early, that's usually not going to happen. So children's ministry really should be a priority for us as a church. If I can explain that to the church and then um, invite people to participate in that, we usually have a pretty good response to that. If I don't give an explanation of why it's so important, then I can't, I, I sh if I as a pastor can't explain it or if my ministry leader can't explain it, why would I expect the, the congregation to think it is? It's like, no, you, you, we gotta understand how important this is. Like, you wanna, you wanna be a missionary? Oh, we got a room for you. <laughs> it's called third, third grade. <laughs> Toddlers, yeah. If you can survive that, God will send you anywhere. It's kind of like when people pray, I'll be a missionary, Lord, just please don't send me anywhere with snakes and spiders or the toddlers. <laughs> no, you should go. Good question. Any, any others before we, we move forward? Okay. Let's move forward. Number four, pastors, elders, leaders need to build relationships with people in the congregation with the intent of helping people find their place or places of service in and to and from the congregation. In other words, um, if, you're, if you serve in leadership, you really need to be making connections with the people that are coming into the church. Not so that we see pe we don't we don't we we are not utilitarians. We do not see people as tools. Ooh, you're young. <laughs> we could put you in with the youth. I speak as one who looks at people that way. <laughs> Oftentimes, no. I want to actually get to know you so that I can find out. Well, what what gifts do you have? What are your passions? Uh, where have you? served in the past or are you a new Christian maybe we shouldn't put you in anything yet for a while you just need to sit you need you need to be here for a while we want we want to help you grow in Christ so um, the only way that we really get that is not on a sign-up list it's in relationship with people so we have to emphasize that relation remember that triune fellowship of father son and holy spirit that works so beautifully together um, we need to develop that type of fellowship that loving fellowship with one another uh, so that we can help people find avenues of service in ministry i have found that well and and statistically um we're told that Gen Zers, they want to be active, man. They, they want to be, they want to stand for something. Well, 
they're the ones who are standing and keeping my car from being able to drive over the interstate because you're blocking it or you know they're they're protesting this or protesting that what if they had something worthwhile to live for what if we took that and said hey let's harness that towards the kingdom and begin to, to give them opportunities to serve in different capacities. Again, you got to be careful, but you also can't be so careful that you just lose them. Find out what skills and gifts people have so that you know how to uh, help them employ those in their daily life, but also in their ministry to the church. Now, we did something this last year. I, I, I would have, um, I, I, I'm not necessarily recommending this, but we did something that has been very helpful for us as a church because we've seen new people come in and it's, I don't know if this happens at your churches, but we kind of have this people that will come one week and then they're gone two weeks and they might come back another week or they're online for three weeks, uh, 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 watching service online and then they show up or, and, and just growth, but it's weird growth. To where, as a pastor, I'm like, I don't even know who's here. I don't, I don't know who the congregation is. I don't know who these people are. It freaks me out. So we did something, uh, and we did it over the course of a month, where we did a survey. And I just told the church, look, I hate surveys. If you call me, and I know it's a survey number, I don't even answer, or I'll hang up on you. But I'm going to ask you to do it. <laughs> I'm not calling you. I'm giving you a survey to fill out. Um, and we asked people, what skills and gifts do you have? And there was a long list of, of options for them. And then on the other side was, what are the passions and interests of your life? And it was a long list of possibilities for them. And we got a really good turnout. We had about 50% of our church that, that filled it out and turned it in over the course of a month. And what we discovered is, man, we have people who have skills at, that they've employed in their life in particular areas in large numbers. And then we have people with these certain passions in, in particular areas in large numbers. If we kind of took those and combined those, this might be who God is bringing into our church for the ministry he wants us to do as a church. Okay. We still need to pray. We're still going to. But for us, it gave us uh, uh, some sense of this is who we are as a church. This is how God has equipped us as a church and the people that he's sent, sent, sending here. Okay, so here's some ministries that we can step out in. And, and I think that's why God is sending us these people. So we're experimenting with that this year. And I'll come back. If they allow me back next year, I'll share an update with you. Each ministry needs a clear leader, but not every leader will lead the same way. Each ministry needs a clear leader, but not every leader will lead in the same way. So my preference is to develop leaders with a first amongst equals mentality. By that I mean we can get five people who, who lead a ministry and they can sit at the table and they can share openly, honestly, um, whatever they're, they're, they're doing in planning or in prepping or in praying or all of that, they can lay that out on the table. One of them will be the one who is the leader of that group. But it's not just the leader of that group sitting there and telling them, here's what we're going to do. It's developing that, that community and communion as a team where we're bringing our different gifts and, and personalities and who we are to this table because God has put us together for this and then there's going to be one of us, there's going to be a James. What's the female version of James? Jane. <laughs> James or a Jane or whatever uh, who is sort of like, okay, now let's put that all together and, and, and here it is. I, my, that's my, my preference because that's humility. The other is kind of a subordinate approach. You all do what I say. That doesn't work very well in team ministry. Uh, it doesn't go very far anyway. You end up with real people who feel like nobody cares. Why am I doing this? I'm out. So each ministry needs a clear leader. Team members need to know that they're loved, they're valued, they're heard, even if their ideas don't prevail in a given situation. This is how you know if you have a healthy team, ministry team, is if people can share things and, and the team is like, yeah, 
bless you, but no, that's not, that, that's not, uh, that doesn't work because, and they don't leave crying. They're like, okay, okay, I see that, I understand. That's a healthy form of team leadership. Number six, ministry teams are most effective when they develop strong relationships. Oh, there's my 10 minute notice. They develop strong relationships together. Um, remember after chapter 12, Paul then said, but there's a better way. That's the love chapter. We can serve as a body, but man, let us serve as a loving body, right? Let us be a loving body. So that requires meeting together. Teams, if you want your team to have that sense of love and joy and service together, then that gets developed not just in the ministry, that gets developed in hanging out together, having lunch together, um, um, doing a little getaway together, just being friends. So you kind of need to develop that to have a healthy team ministry. As ministry grows, uh, a ministry team will grow. It needs to be funded accordingly. So this is where we go from the start of, hey, who are we as a church? What ministries are we propping up? What ministries might we need to go ahead and let, let lie down? What ministries do we need to emphasize? And as we go through that process and a healthy team develops, as a healthy team develops and that ministry grows, it's going to require more money. Church uh, friends, that is a good thing. That is a good thing. This year, uh, we just did our annual church meeting where we talk about our church budget and put that out to the church so they know what's going on. We were able to share with our church that this year we're doubling our children's ministry budget, we're doubling our youth ministry budget, and we're doubling our women's ministry budget from last year because each of those three ministries are thriving and they need more money to continue to grow. And God in his grace keeps providing more money. Now, uh, it, being very honest, we don't have a men's ministry. <laughs> so we could double that and it would be like five to ten dollars. Awesome. <laughs> Guys are like, whoa. <laughs> we get two coffees this year. Yes. <laughs> and sometimes as a pastor, I go, what's wrong? We don't have a men's ministry. Well, we have ministry that happens with men and we do things. It just doesn't cost us money or we pay for it ourselves. So no big deal. These are the ones that God is working in. Let's, let's, so let's feed that. Sometimes that means there needs to be less funding for other things. This is the fun one. In our church this year, we're, we're, we're um, stepping out into uh, local ministry, doing a community-based ministry. And in order to do that, we're shifting some money in our mission ministry funding so our church uh, we have a practice we've given 15 plus percent of our our budget towards funding missions and ministries either from local to around the world and we looked at our and said we're we're propping up some ministries we, we haven't heard from these people in three years we don't even know what's going on um, we need to talk with them but there's ministry that needs to happen here and we're going to make some adjustments to that um, we're going to keep our percentage, but we're going to shift it where it needs to happen. And that's a tough conversation to have. But again, it's the, are we being led of the Lord or are we just propping things up? Because that's the way we've always done it. And that shows up in your money. That shows up what you're spending money on. Okay, last thing. I think we've got seven minutes before we're supposed to be done. Things to guard against. People who have their own agenda. Amen? <laughs> Pushy people. Um, here's how you guard against that. Create a pathway that they are required to follow if they're going to serve. We had this dear sister who um, was sure that she was a wonderful worship leader. And we were in need of worship. We, had a, we got a worship team and they were kind of struggling. And so um, she kind of pushed her way onto the stage. She showed up one day and said, okay, I'm going to help you. And the person who was leading was rarely timid. And the next thing you know, uh, we got a worship leader. Who is this person? And that went on for about three weeks and I'm out of town. And I come back, I'm like, what is going on here? So we had to deal with that. And then we had to go, okay. 
how do we not do this? Well, let's create a path that people, if they're going to be on our worship team, here's how that's going to happen or not. Give them time to find out if they're actually called to this or not. Um, and that's worked beautifully. So part of protecting yourself that way is create those pathways that people are required to follow if they're going to serve. Uh, people who don't think that they have anything to offer, find something small or unseen that they could enjoy doing. Our women's ministry this year had a big event and my wife this last week, she reported that there were over 40 people who served to make that event happen. Um, she's got three people on her women's ministry team leadership, but there's 40 people serving in the ministry. So that's awesome. But it's in small things. And the, and the ladies, they feel totally fulfilled in doing whatever it is that they feel called to do that way. Number three, don't rush the process. Let God develop things in his time. Be willing to let things go or change approach. Sometimes we're just exploring what works best. And then lastly, celebrate victories with the whole church. Celebrate the things that you see the Lord, whoa, this was awesome. So we can, we can report and say, look at what the Lord did. This ministry team over here, and they've got all these people helping underneath them. Praise the Lord. And, and the church loves that. The church celebrates for them. Okay. I finished. Last pause. Anything to add? Anything you have? Questions? Answers? Hmm. Lots of questions in benevolence. <laughs> Thank you, brother. <laughs> Praise the Lord. I if if any of that is helpful to you, I thank God. Yes. Well, I love what Paul says in, in 1 Corinthians there. He talks about the unseen parts of the body are like the really important stuff. So, you know, your bowels are not seen by people, but they're really important. So I don't go to people and say, I think you're a bowel. That, that would be weird. <laughs> Bad idea. But um, there are some people that as you just get to know them, you're thinking, I see you every week. I see you every, I know you love the Lord. Um, what do you like to do, you know? So we have, in, in my church, we had this, we call it the row of widows. So we have this widow row. And my wife, she's really good at this. She finds things for, she, so she calls one of them. They're going to do the shopping for the Christmas thing. And she calls her up and says, would you go to Hobby Lobby with me? You would have thought that she asked her to like, go get a million dollars or something. It was just the greatest thing in the world for her to go do that. And then she became the one who invited the most people to the event. That was her little thing. She knows everybody. She's 80-something years old, so she's just handing out stuff all across town, calling family members. And all it took was just an invitation. Hey, would you go with me to do something? So usually with people that don't feel like they have anything to offer, if you ask them to, to come with you or to do something with you, all of a sudden they see themselves serving and they become a part of it. Yeah, so find, find something that somebody's doing and attach them to it and say, go help them. Yeah. Anything else? I, I learned that one too with, uh, as, as a pastor, if I'm training leaders, um, young leaders, then... I will ask them to come with me to the hospital visitation. Tell them, don't talk, but come with me. <laughs> um, just things like that, where you just give people, bring them into the ministry. Bring them in, invite them in that way. If it's the toddler room, bring them in and then run. Yeah. Bless you. Hey, <laughs> I'm going to the bathroom. <laughs> I'll be back in 40 minutes. <laughs> All right, let's pray together. Lord, thank you for this time. And um, we're just, yeah, Lord, we're just people so we can make a mess of things. But I thank you 
that you love us and that you work with us and that you have given us your Holy Spirit. Um, you've given each of us uh, gifts of your spirit to use. We want to use those faithfully. Um, we pray, God, that you would help us to know how to serve our congregation well, how to um, help disciple people into the callings that you have on their life as well. And we just pray, God, that your church would thrive as you intended. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.